Hello. I'm Mike Rainey. I don't know if any of you all know me. I'm the choir director at St. Paul's Co-Cathedral. In fact, originally, hmm, how the hell should I say this? My talk, when I was first asked, was going to be my conversion story, testimony, but uh, Matthew, who, Matthew Newfeld, who did the talk last month, did a fantastic testimony, and a lot of overlap was there. I will say my testimony revolved more around coming into the church through the beauty of music. And uh, so I'm not surprised then when I heard that there were some rumors that once they saw the title that this was still a, a testimony or conversion story of me coming to the church through <laughs> choir. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is how the devil comes in, through the choir loft. This isn't a, uh, a new bluegrass gospel hit coming up. These were the words of a priest to a choir after Mass on Sunday. Not this Sunday, but a Sunday, a while ago. The words were said in anger and frustration because music does tend to draw out the emotions of everyone involved. Does the devil use the music of the church to sow dissonance? Certainly. And the evidence is in the tension produced even at the foot of the altar. It has been an accusation against church choirs for centuries. This is what I propose to you. One of the variations of this phrase is quite amusing. When Satan fell out of heaven, he landed in the choir loft. Right? This acknowledges there's a long-standing contentiousness that often comes with the music ministry. So we have to take the, this accusation, we have to take it seriously. It isn't an arbitrary accusation. Even though there have been long-standing issues regarding music in the church, it is still to this day considered by most a peripheral discussion regarding the liturgy. Some, maybe most, regard music as merely a matter of taste. De gustibus non est disputandum, as they say, right? Here, point it this way. Here's a relatively recent article from a reputable source, <laughs> shall we say. This article here is critiquing a different website, a website on the internet you can find it what basically made a map of all the reverent masses in the United States that they could find. They, they took all the websites and tried to find certain phrases and markers that would denote that this mass has a reverent mass. So this article is critiquing that, critiquing the uh, criteria, shall we say, the, critiquing the criteria that they used to find what is a reverent mass in it. The author clearly lays out the idea because one of the criteria was polyphony, sacred polyphony, chant, a Gregorian chant. The author clearly lays out the idea that there are no objective qualifiers regarding liturgical music and that those who do propound chant and polyphony as objectively appropriate for liturgy are reflective of a Eurocentric white supremacist bias. Take that as you will. But what comes across distinctly from this is that while we tend to downplay the importance of music, it still seems to evoke a strong, extreme, almost visceral reaction, no matter from what direction we really go. Hence, the accusation of racism towards Scola members in the article and the invective against church choirs stated at the outset really shows us how deeply this affects us all. Then you compound on top of that, that music is elevated in its ministry in the church. It, it forms a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. So this ministry, music ministry, is fraught with danger. It is one of the most difficult to organize, and it often leads to tension between the people involved. Why? Well, there are several factors that come into play, specifically in regards to the music ministry. First of all, it's very personal, personal, personal personality based even. Most roles at mass are constrained by words, by documents or guides, think like a missal or a lectionary. Uh, the lector who goes up and speaks the word of God to the people 
are necessarily contain, they are constrained by the words they speak. They do speak to the congregation, but they are quite limited. Musicians are, we're a different folk, shall we say. They're a little different. Yes, there's music on the page we have to follow. There's text that we are singing to the people. But the efficacy of what we're doing is in the delivery. It really comes down to the individual skill and disposition of the singer or organist or instrumentalist, what have you. Second, singing or playing music well lends itself to pride. This isn't exclusive to the music ministry, of course not. But most other lay involvements are mitigated, mitigated at least by their infrequency in the Mass, right? Um, unless you have one person who does all the readings every Sunday, no matter what, usually there's quite a variation of people. With music, typically, you have the same people at every Mass or uh, the, same, the same number of people. And music is all throughout the Mass, integrated into every portion from the beginning to the end. The choir leads the congregation in responses, and it offers an auditory repose while the people contemplate and pray. This is a very, this is a very important task that needs to be taken seriously. Third, no other ministry puts the dialogue between the priest and the laity so starkly on display. In fact, the entire relationship of the clergyman and the director of music, shall we say, is easily read by any parishioner listening to what's going on. This means if the members of the clergy and the choir are united with one voice and one intention and one temperament, the relationship that they have heightens and lifts the liturgy for the benefit of everyone. But when there's discord, it is extremely exacerbated by the publicity of it. It's on display for everyone. It is good to sing well. That's important to remember. We want to offer our best to the Lord. It is even necessary then to be discriminating in the organization of the ensemble. The Vatican Council even tells us that is true. Whenever, this is from the Second Vatican Council, whenever for liturgical service, which is to be celebrated in sung form, one can make a choice, and one can make a choice between various people. It is desirable that those who are known to be more proficient in singing be given preference. This is especially the case in more solemn liturgical celebrations, and in those which either require more difficult singing, or are transmitted by radio or television, or live stream. YouTube, Facebook, what have you. But there's a difference, shall we say, between singing well as a function of the liturgy and singing well for the purposes of a performance. The actions may seem the same. And to an untrained ear or an inattentive ear, you could say, it may sound nearly the same here too. But the intentions are very different. Again, from the Second Vatican Council, no, nope. that's not from the Second Vatican Council. It should be borne in mind that the true solemnity of liturgical worship depends less on a more ornate form of singing and a more magnificent ceremonial than on its worthy and religious celebration, which takes into account the integrity of the litur liturgical celebration itself and the performance of each of its parts according to their own particular nature. To have a more ornate form of singing in a more magnificent ceremonial is at times desirable when there are the resources available to carry them out properly. On the other hand, it would be contrary to the true solemnity of the liturgy if this were to lead to a part of the action being omitted, changed, or improperly performed. Louder? Closer? Oh, wow. There's a big difference. Okay. Is that better? Okay. All right, now we're cooking with gas. <laughs> when the musicians put the performance of the music above their participation in the prayer of the Mass, there is something deeply wrong. Where are our hearts? Where are our hearts when we sing? Do we sing to God or do we sing to the microphone? 
regarding everyone without participating in the prayers of the liturgy, our music can do nothing. Isaiah spoke harshly as well to those who would make music without looking to God. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the works of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger, and the common people will be parched with thirst. When we consider music as something of a personal expression, or maybe even a reflection of our community or of our culture, it's a paltry substitute for efficacious prayer. The words of Ezekiel also sum up what good the efforts of this music would be to those who would hear it. To them, you're like a singer of love songs, one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. They hear what you say, but they will not do it. And Amos speaks of what the Lord says to that. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. So, Perhaps this is a call to understand a bit more of what the church actually does say about music in the liturgy. So let's do a little quick survey of the last 500 years of church teaching on music. Perhaps in this writing we can get a sense of an overall picture, a sense of a, a, broad, a, broad, a broad shape of what the church desires to see in the liturgy. We'll make sure to pay close attention to the Second Vatican Council, as we should ask ourselves a serious question. Did the church change this picture during or after the Second Vatican Council? It's a serious question. So let's start, as one often does, with the Council of Trent. They shall also banish from churches all those kinds of music in which, whether by the organ or in the singing, there is mixed up anything lascivious or impure, as also all secular actions, vain and therefore profane conversations, all walking about, noise and clamor, so that the house of God may be seen to be and may be called truly a house of prayer. Now, why did the council forbid these things? This seems so obvious, right? Did it really need to say this out loud? Yes, because this was a problem. This was a problem then, and it wasn't new. This was a problem going back a long time, all throughout the church. But the council didn't speak of music too much, didn't deal with it too strongly, having waited until the 22nd session to actually speak about it directly. But at least they did talk about it, right? So of course, because they talked about it, that solved everything. The council was well received, people listened, and everything was great, right? Fantastic. So, then comes 1749, a bit later. This is Benedict XIV, who felt he had to clean up the church, literally and figuratively. He wrote, We prefer as well that all who come to Rome may not leave offended by our customs, but rather from these customs, which they would witness in this city, and in other cities of our dominion, through which it would be their fortune to make their itinerary, returning to their countries, they may be bring back motivations and examples of virtue. He goes on explaining, what does he mean by these customs? He state, well, to do that, he states three goals for the church. Number one, the churches should be clean. They should be free from filth and squalor. The vestments and vessels should be well adorned. But if they can't be, at least make them clean, right? That just seems pretty obvious now, but I guess it wasn't then. Two, and more pertinent to our conversation, the church must restore chant and sacred polyphony. Now he starts talking about this by referring to the divine office, which is interesting because it always seems to go hand in hand whenever the church is talking about music in the liturgy, she always pauses to reflect on how terrible the monks are doing with their divine office every time. 
that the public chanting of the divine office be sung in a becoming and pleasing manner, for nothing is more inimical or pernicious to ecclesiastical discipline than to contemptuously and negligently undertake the divine psalmody in the churches of God. In order to do that, he states, we return to that place from where we have somewhat digressed. This chant is that which stirs the souls of the faithful unto devotion and piety, and therefore it is that which, if it is carried out rightly and decently in the churches of God, is more gladly heard by pious men. And to that other form of singing, which is called harmonized or polyphonic music, is manifested with merit. The whole of the third goal then was dealing with the implementation of said polyphonic music, this new crazy invention sweeping the churches. But it was very controversial at the time. And so was the addition of instruments back into the liturgy. So I won't go too much further into it, but it is a very, it's a fascinating document if you want to go through it. It actually goes through both sides of the debate that was really showcasing the, the, the division in the church on it. But ultimately, his conclusion was summed up by St. Thomas, whom he quoted. And so, great care of ecclesiastical chant, both the one that is called plain or Gregorian chant, which is properly ecclesiastic, and the one that was introduced afterwards in the church, and that is called figured or polyphonic chant, is to be observed. Now, obviously, Trent was not able to corral the instincts of malcontent or quarrelsome musicians. They always seem to be a wily bunch, shall we say. But music, apparently, wasn't really the object of Trent's concerns. Apparently, something else was going on at the same time. But here, Pope Benedict XIV spent a good amount of time thoughtfully and in, in an in-depth way explaining what does the pontiff, what does the church want to see for music. So definitely then this was heard and received by the faithful. They listened and obeyed with docility and humility. Well, then we get to Pius X. And yet again, he feels the need to, dis to address unfortunately seemingly frequent liturgical abuses in the global church. Of all the issues, though in this one, he writes, today our attention is directed to one of the most common of them, one of the most difficult to eradicate, and the existence of which is sometimes to be deplored in places where everything else is deserving of the highest praise. Such is the abuse affecting sacred chant and music. So again, the church didn't really receive the teachings from before because they had felt the need to reiterate the, the general rule. Because they do, he does speak about it, he says, the fact remains that there is a general tendency to deviate from the right rule. What is this rule? It's no different than what his predecessors were saying. He says, on these grounds, the Gregorian chant has always been regarded as the supreme model for sacred music. So that is fully legitimate to lay down the following rule. The more closely a composition for church approaches in its movement, yeah, movement, inspiration, and savor, the Gregorian form, the more sacred and liturgical it becomes. And the more out of harmony it is with that supreme model, the less worthy it is of the temple. He goes on, the ancient Gregorian chant must therefore, in a large measure, be restored to the functions of public worship. And the fact must be accepted by all that an ecclesiastical function loses none of its solemnity when accompanied by this music alone. Special efforts are to be made to restore the use of Gregorian chant by the people so that the faithful may again take a more active part in ecclesiastical offices, as was the case in ancient times. Now, you know, I'm not going to say that you should do it, but a person could come up with a drinking game where you take a drink every time I bring up active participation from here on out. <laughs> But in case you think he restricted things too much, he also had laudable things to say about sacred polyphony as liturgical accompaniment. This then must have been the end of it. 
yet we have Pius XI, only 25 years later saying in his work Divini Cultus. Two points here are pertinent. He says, we wish here to recommend to those whom it may concern the formation of choirs. These in the course of time came to replace the ancient scholae and were established in the basilicas and greater churches, especially for the singing of polyphonic music. Sacred polyphony, we may here remark, is rightly held second only to Gregorian chant. We are desirous, therefore, that such choirs should now also be created anew and prosper, especially in churches where the scale on which the liturgy is carried out demands a greater number and a more careful selection of singers. You'll notice that if you go into these documents, you'll find that the, the popes are very careful to mention that there is different expectations for the churches, for various churches. You cannot expect the same of a small country parish as you can of a cathedral. The cathedral should be the example for the smaller ones. Now that may be great and all, choirs, that sounds so fantastic, right? But that might be great and all for them. But what about the people attending? This is another chance to take a shot. <laughs> in order that the faithful may more actively participate in divine worship, let them be made once more to sing the Gregorian chant, so far as it belongs to them to take part in it. It is most important that when the faithful assist at the sacred ceremonies, they should not merely be detached and silent spectators, but filled with a deep sense of the beauty of the liturgy, they should sing alternately with the clergy or with the choir as it is prescribed. You might be seeing more and more, shall we say, more and more of the threads of thoughts that would come together in the Second Vatican Council. There, is movements, there are movements in this time called the liturgical movement, which I won't get into really, but you can see the threads of these starting to coalesce. Pope Pius XII, apparently the issue is still not solved. In his encyclical on the liturgy, he comments briefly about music as well. He says, let the clear and guiding norms of the apostolic see be scrupulously observed. Gregorian chant which the Roman church considers her own as handed down from antiquity and kept under her close tutelage, is proposed to the faithful as belonging to them also. We also exhort you, the bishops of course, to promote with care congregational singing and to see to its accurate execution with all due dignity, since it easily stirs up and arouses the faith and piety of large gatherings of the faithful. And here he waxes poetic on it even. Let the full harmonious singing of our people rise to heaven like the bursting of a thunderous sea. Okay, now, but I'm, I'm, I'm sensing some doubt perhaps. Perhaps I have some detractors in the crowd. You never know. I hear, I hear the voice of my critics saying, okay, but that was before the Second Vatican Council. Surely the Pope's after the Second Vatican Council sang a different tune, shall we say. Okay, well... Let's start right away with Pope Paul VI. In 1968, drawing specifically on the Council of Trent, he states, if music, instrumental and vocal, does not possess at the same time the sense of prayer, dignity and beauty, it precludes its entry into the sphere of the sacred and the religious. He goes on, one must above all not lose sight of the function of sacred music and liturgical song. Otherwise, any attempt at reform would be futile. And the correct and appropriate use of the various structural elements of the noble and holy enterprise, which are, as you well know by now, Gregorian chant, sacred polyphony, and modern music would be impossible. Now, notice, it, I, had, I reduced it here a bit, but notice when he describes the various expressions of music, he uses an order, first Gregorian chant, next is polyphony, next comes music of the time, right? It's not an accident. Well, how about Pope John Paul II? Among the musical expressions that correspond best with the qualities 
demanded by the notion of sacred music, especially liturgical music, Gregorian chant has a special place. In here, he even goes as far as to say, to reinstate, reconfirm the general rule of Pope Pius X, quoting it directly. The closer a composition draws its inspiration from the Gregorian form, the more appropriate it is for Mass. This is Pope John Paul II stating this. It is necessary, he says, first of all, to emphasize the music destined for its sacred rites must have holiness as its reference point. The choir especially cannot forget this point. True performance flows from the interior disposition of prayer. Indeed, it is the exterior expression of that interior disposition. In this, John Paul reflects Pius XII when he says, but the chief element of divine worship must be interior. Well, Pope Benedict, surprising no one, also had something to say about this too. In the West, in the form of Gregorian chant, the inherited tradition of psalm singing was developed to a new sublimity and purity, which set, and I wanted to emphasize this, it sets a permanent standard for sacred music, music for the liturgy of the church. Polyphony developed in the late Middle Ages, and then instruments came back into divine worship. This is what Pope Benedict XIV was dealing with. Quite rightly too, Benedict says, because as we have seen, the church not only continues the synagogue, but also takes up in the light of Christ's path, the reality represented by the temple. But if that wasn't clear enough, he does say, an authentic updating of sacred music can only take place in the lineage of the great tradition of the past, of Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony. Okay, but I know there are still critics out there. In fact, I heard one this week. I had a, shall we say, a discussion with a clergyman about the Second Vatican Council. Having seen the renovation plans for St. Paul's, he was, what shall we say, rather opinionated on how uninformed people are of what Vatican Council really wanted people to take from it. Okay. So I still know that there, I have those critics out there and they are saying, yes, but, but you mentioned all the popes except for one. And surely he's on our side, they say. Hmm. So I want to quote rather extensively from Pope Francis. I think it's very important to get his context and to discover exactly how, hmm, how much in line with the rest of teaching on these matters he is. He stated in 2019, St. Paul VI wanted you to be renewed and active for a music that is integrated with the liturgy and draws its fundamental characteristics from it, not just any music, but a holy music, because the rites are holy, adorned with nobility of art, because for God we must give the best, universal so that everyone can understand and celebrate. Especially, it should be well distinct and different from the music used for other purposes. He continues, Benedict XVI exhorted you to not forget the music heritage of the past, but to renew it and increase it with new compositions. Dear friends, I too encourage you to continue on this road. Together you can devote yourselves better to song as an integral part of the liturgy with Gregorian chant, inspiring you as the first model. Take care together for artistic and liturgical preparation and promote the presence of the Schola Cantorum in every parish community. Can you imagine that? Pope Francis saying that we should have a Schola Cantorum chanting Gregorian chant in every parish community? Wow. Stunned speechless. But he goes on. In fact, the choir guides the assembly and with its own specific repertoire is a skilled voice of spirituality, of community, of tradition and of liturgical culture. I recommend that you help the whole people of God to sing with conscious 
and active participation and in the liturgy. Your dedication to the liturgy and to its music represent a way of evangelization to all levels, from children to adults. The liturgy is, in fact, the first teacher of catechism. And here he finishes. Sacred music also reveals another duty, that of joining Christian history together. In the liturgy, and now this is very reflective of a previous pope, in the liturgy resound Gregorian chant, polyphony, congregational song and music of the present day. These were the words of Pope Francis. And the order in which, again, the order in which Pope Francis speaks of the various musical expressions is, again, no accident. The language he uses here is in direct line in continuity with his predecessors. He is fully shaped, therefore, by the language of the Second Vatican Council. So let's go there. Okay. Has anyone read this? You should have. <laughs> Good. This was the first text promulgated by the Second Vatican Council, about a little over a year since the opening of the Council. And that the fact that this is the only remaining document that was a draft document, shall we say, it was written before the Council, offered to the bishops. This is the only one of all of them that survived intact or largely unscathed, if you want to go that route. So this speaks very clearly, I'd say, to the non-controversial nature it really was to the church at the time. It was received very well by every member, well, maybe not every member, but the vast majority of all the Curia. Hmm. Maybe I won't make as many friends with this statement, but I will say that that shows very clearly that the desire to reform the liturgy was universal in the leadership of the church. This was the desire of the church. So being the text promulgated, first text promulgated, it tells us right at the beginning what the purpose of the council really was for, what it wanted. So it tells us this sacred council has several aims in view. It desires to impart an ever-increasing vigor to the Christian life of the faithful, to adapt more suitably to the needs of our own times, those institutions which are subject to change, to foster whatever can promote union among all who believe in Christ, to strengthen whatever can help to call the whole of mankind into the household of the church. These didn't come out of nowhere. In fact, almost all the documents that we went through already were the forerunners, were the inspiration for this council. Pope Pius X through 12th all requested, maybe even could say required, the promotion of active participation amongst the laity. So that's why they say, Mother Church, earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. To promote active participation, the people should be encouraged to take part by means of acclamations, responses, psalmody, antiphons and songs, as well as by actions, gestures, and bodily attitudes and at the proper times, all should observe a reverent silence. It's not talking about a merely communal gesticulating that denotes an act of participation. In fact, the instruction on music, specifically, following directly from this document, you can see here, musicam sacram, actually tells us very clearly what is, what is active participation. We hear it so much. And that tells us this participation should be above all internal in the sense that by it the faithful join their mind to what they pronounce or hear and cooperate with heavenly grace. It must be, on the other hand, external also. That is, such as to show the internal participation by gestures and bodily attitudes, by the acclamations, responses, and singing. But in order that the liturgy may be able to fully produce 
produce its full effects, it is necessary that the faithful come to it with proper dispositions, that their minds should be attuned to their voices, and that they should cooperate with divine grace, lest they receive it in vain. This is, this is what popes have been trying to express to the faithful for centuries. Be a part, be a part of the liturgy. This is for you. This is for God, of course, but you are participating in the coming together of heaven and earth. Pius XII very clearly was leading up to this when he stated, it's not merely a question of recitation or of singing, which, however perfect according to the norms of music and, this, and the sacred rites, when it only reaches the ear, but it is especially a question of the ascent of the mind and heart to God, so that united with Christ, we may completely dedicate ourselves and all our actions to him. At this point, I would say, it should come as no surprise then when the Second Vatican Council does speak specifically about music, it is absolutely in line with the desires of the church before and after. The church acknowledges Gregorian chant as specially suited to the Roman liturgy. Therefore, other things being equal, it should be given pride of place in liturgical services. In fact, Vatican II goes so far as to position music as the highest of the arts. I'm sorry if there's any painters, sculptors, architects, carvers. What you do is great. It's valuable to the church, but music is considered preeminent because of its natural coming together in the liturgy with word and song. So I'm sorry, but this is now dogma. <laughs> So this might be surprising to some, actually. If you haven't delved into it too deeply, the Second Vatican Council was very specific on what's acceptable and not acceptable in its instruction on music. Here's a few examples. Has anyone seen something like this talked about? I wonder. Father Jeffrey certainly, uh, he knows this one, yes. But it is it's quite interesting because, how do I say, I would, I would, I think it's, uh, it would be a struggle to find a church that follows this to the letter. Right? Let's bear that in mind. This, this is what the church is proposing to us. The church in the Second Vatican Council proposed that when you are singing the Mass, there is a hierarchy. You know, like, hierarchy, like think Jordan Peterson, hierarchy. There's a hierarchy of singing in the Mass. There are three degrees, such that if you don't sing the first degree, you shall not sing the second or the third. You need the first degree to be sung in order for it to be a sung mass. Let's look at it, because this is, I always find this fascinating because, well, like I said, it's hard to find. I don't think any church really follows this as a principle, shall we say. But the important thing is to look why, why is everything in the first row of the first degree? Because that is aimed around the participation of the laity. They want you to be there responding. So the initial greeting and response, sing it. The prayer over the offerings, the preface and the dialogue, sing them. The Sanctus, of course. The doxology, the, can, can, the Lord's Prayer. This is of the highest importance for us to sing if, we're, if we are going to sing at Mass. The dismissal? The dismissal is of a higher priority than, say, the Gloria. This, this blew my mind when I first read this. But it makes sense. This is the faithful, the lady and the clergy coming together in praise of God in our communication as the people of God. So like I said, I don't know if you've seen this before, but... This is what it had, had stated. It also stated that, again, cathedrals and other major churches are to establish choirs and scola cantorum. The choir may not accompany the litur liturgy in such a way that the faithful cannot participate. 
it's great and all. If we wanted to do a mass, we had a full orchestra and we could did Mozart's Requiem. And all the lady had to, laity had to do was go in there and just listen. That's not right. They need a part in the mass. They don't have to sing everything, but if, if nothing in the propers or the ordinary is available to them, that's to be reprimanded. Boys, in particular, are to be given instruction on sacred music. Hmm? Do, you, do you encourage your sons to sing? Please do. We could use them in our choirs. To this day, the Pope's personal choir, as they're known as, the Sistine Chapel Choir, still only consists of boys and men. All choirs, as well, must be given liturgical and spiritual formation in addition to their musical training. They need to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And maybe still controversially, it stated that choirs with women in it shouldn't be in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. I'm just stating the facts here, folks. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a step back. We've gone through a whirlwind journey of popes and encyclicals and councils. What is the consistent response? If there is one, I would say there is. Music is an integral part of the liturgy. I think that's pretty non-controversial at this point. But as such, that means that all, not all music is appropriate for the liturgy. It's not, not everything is fitting because music is in service of the liturgy, like a humble handmaiden, as they said in the council. Now, sometimes the church has prohibited certain types of music. Think Pope Pius X, prohibiting operatic overtures and such in, in the liturgy. I mean, one could make an argument that Rossini still doesn't have a place in the liturgy. But instead of that, the church prefers to offer to you, for your consideration, shall we say, the standard or the hierarchy of appropriate music, beginning with, of course, Gregorian chant, followed closely by sacred polyphony, and always, always, always encouraging the people to sing. Not just, we're not talking just to say, you know, sing your popular, the popular songs that you know, but the people should know the chants, first and foremost. Other types of music, now this is key, this was, now we're referring a bit back to that National Catholic Reporter uh, article. Other types of music can be integrated, of course, but it must be subservient to the character and nature of the liturgy. And the role of the choir is leading the people in active and individual participation. Don't tell me you're sick of hearing the, that phrase yet. And sacred music, finally, is a key component of evangelization. So I want to then reflect back now on that article a little bit from National Catholic Reporter, because in it, you sense a common contemporary critique of the traditional aesthetics of our church's sounds, the soundscape of our church. They say, you have no right to judge other cultures and keep them from the mass. And that's not what we're saying at all. In fact, all people, all cultures are welcome in the church. <coughs> Everyone is welcome. You must first be baptized. Just like people are baptized, cultures must be baptized. And we must ensure, I am personally not offering any critique or criticism or judgment of any particular cultural expression in the Mass. That's not for me to decide. That's for the ordinary. That's for the bishop to decide. All I can do is present what the church says we should consider as the first model, according to Pope Francis. <coughs> Gregorian chant, I'll say, is rightly considered the model for liturgical music because, in a sense, it isn't a cultural expression. It is properly ecclesiastical. It drew its origins from many different cultures and has been integrated for so long in the church 
is you can't rightly consider it one, per, one people's uh, object in which to own. It's for everyone. The issue of enculturation in general, it's not within the scope of this talk, shall we say. But on the limited space of music, of liturgical music, I hope I have shown that the church has spoken clearly on its vision of what it, actually, what it wants to see. Such that music can be a vehicle of evangelization. <coughs> it's not merely a matter of taste, where one expression is as good as the other. Another claim is often bandied about. The Second Vatican Council did away with all those things, kind of reflecting onto my, shall we say, gentle discussion I had with the priest this weekend. But I hope by now you can see that that claim, at least in this regard, is demonstrably false. Even the germ, germ, is it germ or germ? The germ, yeah, the germ, that thing. <coughs> I can't argue with that now, can you? It reiterates exactly what the council declared on music. The main place should be given all things being equal to Gregorian chant as being proper to the Roman liturgy. I leave the second paragraph for you to ponder on your own. But a word to the various groups connected through sacred music. First to our priests and all our clergy. Please understand what I'm presenting is not done in the vein of judgment or condemnation of any specific practice of your own parishes. Everything here has to be moderated through your own pastoral understanding of your particular community. But just don't let that be the end of it. Music is important. It's worthy even to invest in. That's been requested by the church for centuries. Now, for those of you in choirs, how many are in a choir here? A paltry few. <laughs> Let's pump those numbers up. These are rookie numbers. <laughs> but we got to remember that our remember our place in the church, and to submit to proper authority, with docility and humility. Our role is privileged, as music is held in the highest esteem. Being given that responsibility of elevating the, lit the liturgy means a great deal of trust is laid on the choir's shoulders. David said, may the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands. Our abilities can be used to raise the hearts of the congregation, but it can also cut us down with our pride and our ego. For those of you in the congregation, remember that you are indeed called upon to actively participate. That when you sing, you enrich the life of the whole church when you refuse to participate in the external actions of the community, that refusal is a process of separation and a breaking apart of the people of God. It's like a refusal to eat the food offered to you at a communal meal. It's a rejection of the sacrifice of praise offered to God in the Mass. Your responses, singing, gestures, are reflective of the interior disposition of the faith community as a whole. Therefore, when there is discord or disunity in action, it denotes disunity in heart and mind. As is right, the final word should go to Pope Benedict. He says, I am convinced that the crisis in the church is to a large extent due to the disintegration of the liturgy in that it is a matter of indifference whether or not God exists, or whether or not he speaks to us and hears us. But when the community of faith, the worldwide unity of the church and her history, and the mystery of the living Christ are no longer visible in the liturgy, where else then is the church to become visible in her spiritual essence? Then the community only celebrates itself. An activity that is, utter uh, that is utterly fruitless, and because the ecclesial community cannot have its origin from itself, but emerges as a unity only from the Lord through faith, such circumstances will inexorably result in a disintegration. Now, I think this is key for our times. 
and result in a disintegration into sectarian parties of all kinds. Partisan op opposition within a church tearing herself apart. This is why we need a new liturgical movement, which will call to life the real heritage of the Second Vatican Council. 